for having me. Um, also, I've asked to talk about uh, what I've been up to, which is a bit difficult when you're a journalist and it's really an ADHD profession. You sort of bounce from subject to subject, getting extremely interested and invested in it, and then immediately changing. I mean, had reference to this Wolf syndrome. I think I looked at the Nazi mass killer manifestos for that for um, three months in the wake of the Christchurch shooting. Um, and that's obviously quite different to this project, which largely involved the analysis of uh, thousands of pages of financial statements. Um, but anyway, so we decided to pick this uh, the tax gap because uh, some time has passed and it's sort of a clear piece of uh, sustained reporting that led to, uh, I guess, you know, ha ha had an impact on government policy. I got a few shout outs in the Hansa, which is quite nice, um, and managed to flip the government around. And I think we're getting a couple of hundred million dollars more revenue uh, each year as a result, which is quite good. Um, unfortunately, New Zealand doesn't have a similar system like the US does with the IRS, where they pay bounties um, for people who. <laughs> identify tax fraud because um, I think it's going to be right now. <clears throat> anyway, as it stands, um, so I'm going to talk through the tax gap, both in terms of uh, where I'm from, the sort of work where I see my work fitting into the sort of public sphere and adding to public debate, and then working through how I um, uh, put that project together and sort of sustained it until eventually I moved on to other things. I've got struck by Peter Thiel and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, but I will uh, allow um, there should be a big bunch of time for questions both on this project or other um, weird things I've done in my time. Um, so first up, we have oh no, it's not screwing. Someone help me. Be able to jump on us. I can talk. Anyway, um, so first of all, I um, I I've mapped up it obviously. Um, I've gotten to journalism in a fairly roundabout fashion. I actually spent my time at um, university, uh, four years, five years even, uh, training to be a diplomat with MFAT. And I applied twice to get into their sort of officer training corps and failed. Couldn't even get an interview. Um, found myself unemployed for a year and started doing some freelance work for the listener. Um, one thing led to another, and I ended up working at Salient. Um, I dropped out of ADT, so that's another, another failure. I think I applied for Fulbright twice and didn't get in. Um, I think so I was waitlisted and spent a year um, at Columbia in New York doing this, which is quite good. Uh, I came back uh, and then I worked as a mercenary in a number of newsrooms around New Zealand. I started at the listener, then got laid off during the GFC. Um, I was doing the way set up for action for um, uh, Marcus Lush, uh, his radio show Night Shifts, that was quite terrible. Um, then I uh, reinvented myself as a tabloid news reporter and heard on Sunday with maternity cover. Um, uh, then reinvented myself yet again as a business journalist at NBR where I broke the um, uh, fraud at South Canterbury Finance, a notable story called Hiding the Hyatt, where I discovered a whole pile of um, uh, bad loans that were related party that had been hidden in the name of a meat worker who never visited the Hyatt Hotel and had to be the brother of the director. That's great because they used to stooge that didn't understand about legal privilege or lawyer or a lawyer and when I called him up he admitted everything. <laughs> and yeah, so it was one point five billion dollars more tax, which is quite fun. Um he then moved to the Southern Star Times uh, and then finally to the Dillon Hill. So I've run the gamut from um when I started at Columbia, I actually wanted to train as I'm like a literary feature writer and do columns. Um and then I've ended up doing everything from tabloid news to breaking news to business news. And now this weird sort of investigations category, which covers business politics and a few other things. Um, I've got these slides are available online. There's a link at the front. I'll tweet it out too. Um, but yeah, there's some other things you can do. Um, this is a picture from my time at the Herald on Sunday when I was accosting a woman who was, I think, she was scanning spare change from people at supermarket car parks. Um, claiming she was out of petrol. She's holding a can of fly spray and a shoe there, and she takes the fly spray me in the eyes with fly spray. <laughs> And then hurls the shoe. But <laughs> let it never be said that journalism lacks groupies because I get a lot of fan mail. <laughs> people, um, and it's not really a job um, to make friends. I mean, you're not trying to make enemies either, um, but you have to wear quite a lot of public criticism if you're sort of operating in a public space. Um, I've done a bit of thinking about why I do what I do and how journalism fits into politics. And I studied political science, public policy. And I'm sort of very interested in how this interacts. And I see journalists generally uh, try adding things to the public sphere. So you've got this, this red triangle there, this formal secrets, 
stuff the spires up to. Matthew Hager is the best exponent in New Zealand of dragging that stuff into the public square for discussion and debate. I'm not interested in this green triangle, this, this, sort of, this public information, but it's not really accessible or known. And a lot of people uh, in certain fields will know things um, that are actually really interesting, but they won't get their news because they think they know them and everyone knows them, therefore it's not. For instance, I broke the fact that Peter Thiel, that billionaire, um, was a secret New Zealand citizen. And it turned out half the tech community already knew this and didn't think it was notable. Because one, they would heard it several years ago and thought it was self news um, and didn't quite realise that no one else knew. And of course it was huge news. I still get calls from European public TV stations wanting to do documentaries on Peter Thiel's secret bunker. In New Zealand, I keep telling them it's a bunker of the mind, there's no concrete reinforced like glass shelter, and then they don't quote me because they don't get what they want. <coughs> so generally I try working on uh, trying to find sort of public information and, and dragging it to public square for discussions. Basically to better inform public debate. Um, journalism is, despite you know this uh, this very population of the fourth state, um, it's a very informal craft. And much like New Zealand's constitutional arrangements, it's informal and relies on convention. I have no powers really beyond what normal members of the public do. I cannot compel people to talk to me, um, which means I have to rely entirely on credibility and reputation. People have to want to talk to me because they trust I'll report them accurately, I'll maintain confidences, um, and I'll get things right. So it's, it's a very strange sort of nominally powerless. Um, profession, which can be quite pressing, but um, you can understand how power works, and that knowledge in itself has power. So, I quite like, I mean, I spent a lot of years in business journalism, I've been, I've been on and off the business desk, do a lot of white collar crime reporting, which I love because it's, it's the purest form of moral crusading you can do. Someone took money from someone else, and you can show the money, and it's very clear cut. Um, the perpetrators are often doing it over many years, they're doing it while it's sober, uh, there's no messy uh, sort of interpersonal or domestic issues, which to give it, it's just a sad story, there's something bad happened, it's just someone stole money, right? it's great. Um, business journalism I describe as, sort of as you are reporting the way the world works, the way um, resources are allocated, profits are distributed, winners and losers, while politics is some arguments over the way the world should work. And the crossover here is quite interesting because I found um, during my career that um, focusing on money is quite useful because it allows you to quantify things and quantifying things with a value all of its own. I remember when Lords single, uh, single Royals got the top of the charts, the entertainment desk were very excited, business not so much. And then I sat down and crunched how much money um, she, she was she'd like to have made off the back of that. It was like $10 million in the first six months. And it's, it's every eight hours she was selling more albums in the US than um, the normal number one single, number one album in New Zealand sells over a whole year. And it was just ridiculously off the chart. And basically able to show that for a while there, um, Lord was bringing in more export earnings to New Zealand than the scanty industry. And while I mentioned that media is nominally powerless, um, it does have a, a pretty a unique power in being able to force issues onto the agenda, whether that's for government or for public discussion. And I mean, I've talked enough for people at the Beehive to know that um, you know, if you write about something enough and well enough and people care about it, um, things happen. And I guess that's often what I'm aiming to do. I'm not trying to write the policy because I mean, I'll get down to why this is a terrible idea, because that's it's very difficult to get the 50 bits right and the constraints of journalism where you're trying to sort of write for an average age of 12 year old readers and get it across concisely. But you can sort of say, look, there appears to be an issue here, maybe we should do something about it. And I've managed to do this a bunch of times, but uh, the biggest one was clearly the existing tax gap story. I just want to just point out that um, the sorts of people that I never write about um, tend to be quite hard targets. They are the rich, they are the powerful. I mean, um, power is money, but money is also power. Um, they can afford QCs. New Zealand defamation law is not very protective. Of, um, of journalism in New Zealand effectively puts the onus of proof onto the publisher. So for instance, a lot of this Me Too reporting is tremendously difficult to get across the line. Because if you accuse someone of being a rapist, effectively if they challenge you 
the publisher will have to prove they're a rapist, which effectively is running a criminal prosecution, which normally Crown Law will spend, I don't know, a year putting together with you know a dozen detectives and lawyers, and it just it becomes an almost impossible task. Um, I've also learned something I was in contact with the hack of Rorschach during the Jenny Politics saga. I was the one who made Judith Collins resign the first time. Um, and one lesson I learned from that is um, that if you have a particularly pointy story, it is really good practice to be really open with who you're writing about. You let them know, I've got your correspondence, this is what it says, this is what I'm intending to write. Because even if they decide not to comment, and in cases like most of the cases I write about, I always get a no comment. You've told them in advance where you're going to write, and they can't, after the fact, complain you've got it wrong. You gave them an opportunity, that didn't take you up. Others are explained. So, um, try extending this further. I think with this tax gap story, I actually put my work in the spreadsheet up um, about a month after I ran the story, just so people can see what I'm doing. I quite like the idea of um, good journalism being like good science and be really open with the methodology to allow others to replicate it for us with the call of business art matching. So, everyone can, you can call the same person up. So, they'll get the same quotes, or at least one <laughs> say, like, um, this quote of you. And the same story can be replicated, and it sort of becomes true at that point when you've got enough cover up there. So, the, in 2016, um, the Herald had formed an investigations team and we were asked to pick some big ambitious projects. Um, and one thing that had interested me uh, was this idea of uh, sort of international tax avoidance. It appeared to be this enormous issue that um, seemed very abstract. I mean, tax, discussion about tax generally is. Not very widespread, which is very strange because it's literally half of government. Like, there's a lot of discussion about how government spends money, but not nearly so much as to how it raises money. And you can't have one without the other. Um, effectively, sort of international uh, space um, with you know 240 odd um, tax jurisdictions operates as a uh, a prisoner's dilemma with 240 players, and. That large companies effectively, and I don't think they've uh, had a sort of master plan to arrange this, but effectively run a, um, uh, a race to the bottom in terms of international tax rate. But the, there's a, a couple of important principles with the tax. One is uh, sort of uh, double tax, you shouldn't pay tax twice on income. And so uh, when you've got issues with multinational companies, the double uh, companies manufacturer that makes them in country A and sells in country B, where do you get taxes at A or is it B? This becomes vastly more complicated when you start dealing with certain industries that rely on uh, research and development or intellectual property, because that can happen in a third or fourth jurisdiction. But lo and behold, we've got companies that are, do operate across multiple jurisdictions, they tend to shunt all their um, revenue into the ones with the lowest taxes. So it's like typically note uh, Ireland and the Netherlands there, because uh, they're countries inside the EU, and um, effectively, they would put all the European revenue there and so it's pay tax in all the other European countries. So you can I think Ireland was the worst, of course, the worst of by far, because they had like a ridiculous uh, international rate, like 2%, um, which is quite really low in New Zealand, it's really high. Um, And the debate on this area in New Zealand was very, at the time, was very, um, what's the word I'm looking at here? It lacked all context. Occasionally, you get stories about. Facebook company paid hundred thousand dollars in tax, and I was always just asking, well, is that particularly bad? Is Facebook worse than the others? I mean, what's what's the comparison? And of course, uh, the corporate tax base is quite important to government coffers. I mean, it's like twelve billion dollars annually, so there's lots of zeros which get to the end. Um, the IRD is a very interesting fund to deal with. I mean, I've done stories on GCSB and SIS, um, and they're obviously quite secret, but I think the IRDs. Are found to be uh, the worst to deal with. Um, they've got this principle written as their act, their act uh, the tax secrecy provisions, which effectively means ID cannot comment about the uh, affairs of individual taxpayers. The interpretation of this is broadened, and I'll give an example of how broad that is. But effectively, there's been this uh, agreed trade off in New Zealand of uh, efficiency over transparency that ID will not will effectively um, keep things. Uh, quiet and try to maintain uh, the most efficient, highest rates of uh, taxation 
the trade-off means that um, IAD is able to, to talk with taxpayers and come to arrangements, come to settlements, and it's all out of the public eye. And so effectively there's this big, um, there's a huge amount of trust required of the public of IAD. And there's no real way to oversee uh, what's going on outside of sort of the broad headline numbers of how many billions they pulled in each year. So to look at this, I um, to look at this issue, I had a talk with Don Tro, who's a, a United Professor of Accounting um, at FIF, and was wondering a way that we could have how, how to measure the level of tax avoidance in New Zealand. Um, and he suggested a way, uh, maybe sort of comparing the margins, profit margins, I every hundred dollars of revenue, how many dollars of reported profits reported between these New Zealand subsidiaries of multinationals and their parents. Um, so effectively to do that, because on the company's office, um, each year these uh, large large companies with these subsidiaries are wholly owned, if they're foreign owned, they uh, have to file annual accounts. And these are audited, and they've got some basic financial information. Unfortunately, they're all on dirty PDFs. Um, so going through and assembling them requires me clicking about five clicks from the company's office, downloading it, and then literally doing a data entry job. Um, I yanked the uh, Deloitte each year, which I had a list of the 200 largest companies in New Zealand, and I went through all 200 trying to figure out who was owned by an overseas listed company. And we've got about 100 there, uh, and then I added in a few more that I thought should be on there, like Google and Facebook. Um, and then started going through, plugging in uh, the period local accounts covered, revenue, possible tax, the amount of income tax provision, the amount of margins there, and then doing the same for their parents. So, for instance, I think you found like these, the, for example, Apple, their New Zealand subsidiary um, booked almost a billion dollars in revenue, reported only about $20 million in profits. But meanwhile, the um, Apple HQ over in the States was reported margins of 40%. So that's 2% in New Zealand. And on the whole, Apple's also booking most of its revenue in Ireland and so So basically, I just wanted to work out who had the biggest difference between um, sort of parent report margins and the other one. So the spreadsheet took about two weeks to pull together. Um, as you can see, it got quite convoluted because we're also trying to work out ways to um, take into account foreign exchange differences because a lot of a lot of the parents were reporting in yen or US dollars or euros. Um, and the results. But quite interesting. Um, it appears as though the uh, list I pulled together um, was better than ID was prepared to release publicly. At least the Green Party asked for some more information. Um, so we had, of these 106 multinational subsidiaries in Zealand, uh, each year they had $67 billion in revenue, which I think accounts for about a third of GDP. So this is like a really good picture of a large, large slice of the economy. Um, one of the interesting uh, fact nuggets to call out was the banking sector, who are um, often lambasted for you know extracting huge profits from New Zealanders. Um, at least they're reporting the profits here and paying tax on them. But they account for they count for 78 percent of all tax on my data set. Um, I did try calling out the Banks Association to ask whether they wanted to comment on you know um, being New Zealand's greatest tax base. They did not want to engage. In fact none of the companies I wrote about really wanted to engage beyond the short line. I mean, Corporates had a real problem talking publicly about tax. Uh, they talked a lot behind the scenes through through these sort of uh, uh, consulting firms, and they, you know, I can see their submissions on tax law. They were quite engaged there, but it's a very difficult subject for them to talk about publicly, particularly in the of subsidiary when uh, the parent is facing similar sorts of questions all over the world. But there's there's a large swathes of the economy were paying practically no income tax. And this sort of reflected um, the international experience. Uh, the ones that are particularly digitally weightless uh, or tied up a lot with uh, intellectual property rights of uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the tech industry really jumped out. I also found it was strange because both Google and Facebook, uh, most notably, reported really, really low revenues here. And that's because, again, they've overranged their affairs and they'll um, charge a New Zealand customer. Uh, money to advertise uh, to say people in the states, but then that uh, transaction will be arranged from a sort of a sales office in Singapore. So it all got reported in Singapore, not the US, not New Zealand. And so it was, I didn't really quite know how big Google or Facebook were, but I, after spending two weeks on this, I couldn't really um, 
uh, dig in. I didn't lay it anyway. We'll see how we go. So the, the headline figures we had for this were, so I started to try to focus this debate, again, pulling it from an abstract um, problem, which is sort of everyone acknowledges the multinational uh, tax avoidance exists. But um, it's very difficult to sort of see it directly around you, but um, as the sort of naming of the companies that are involved in it, I just looked at the, the top 20 companies, sort of the ones with the biggest difference in margins. Um, and amongst that group, um, we clicked up quite a good front page, I thought. Um, so the top 20 companies made, were making $10 billion of sales annually in New Zealand, uh, but they're only paying $1.8 million in tax each year. Uh, if they reported margins, if those 20 companies reported margins in New Zealand, if they did it for their parents, they should have been paying about 450 million. Now, of course, there's far more work um, in terms of making that profit occurred outside of New Zealand, so it shouldn't be 450, but it probably should be more than practically zero, which uh, effectively is what I was saying. I mean, this, this is not a question of illegality, it's a question of uh, how the rules are presently structured and how the rule works. And my big question here is. Do we want it to work this way? Because uh, it appears, certainly, because it was quite a thing. So, um, while I found it very difficult to get comments from the companies involved, there were some major corporate players were willing to talk. Of course, they had a, had a dog in the fight. I think the um, sign moved of the chief executive of Spark, who's directly competing against the likes of Netflix, was quite vocal about this. Saying, look, how can I compete against these guys when they are able to shunt all their money through Bermuda? Well, I have to pay 28% of New Zealand. This is fundamentally unfair. And in the long run, um, you know, they have an advantage and <laughs> probably crush us and we'll just take that back. <clears throat> so um, we rolled this out in a series of stories. We had the big front page, a big feature in the business section. Um, I had a few follow-up stories, including I think at the time one of the drug companies was trying to get uh, Keytruda funded, they're asking for like $50 million a year. And I went through their accounts and found um, the drug company behind there was actually paying less tax per year than John Key. Um, and the response, unusually, um, in my experience, um, was immediate. Well, I could not get the minister on the phone prior to the publication of the story. So then, uh, well, hours, I think John Key went on the, the weekend talk show, was asked about it, and said the findings don't seem fair. Uh, he even when I think the APEC meeting some months later, where he actually quoted Mark Zuckerberg and gave him grief about tax, which is amazing. Um, yeah, I think they were aware of an election was coming up. Labor had picked up the issue. This was a point that was potentially vulnerable. Um, so a lot of uh, things collided. It's quite good. Um, a lot of other the cartoonists were absolutely nuts with it, which was lovely. Um, Rod Emerson Hill, he's the diversity of the ones. Um, Cheating them out, it was great. Um, it feels quite, I mean, there's all sorts of problems with big corporate media, but um, when it all comes together like this, it's extremely rewarding. You get graphics, I have people that give me, you know, they're part of the put together. Um, so even the revenue minister, who didn't talk to me initially, um, became quite friendly. He was talking, uh, he talked about the, the whole uh, tax planning sector, who had been quite uh, dismissive of um, my reporting. Uh, prior, um, I basically had to concede that they were losing the debate at this point. Um, you know, they were sure they were operating with, within, the, within the rules and the rules were fine, but um, there were enough questions being raised about, well, is this outcome fine? Um, and, uh, you know, so the minister criticised them for their deafening silence. Um, I decided to stay on the subject for uh, about 18 months. Uh, I wrote 20 more stories over the course of the year. Um, I think we do an annual Mood of the Boardroom survey and ask a few questions about tax in there. That's quite good. That was like a um, uh, big list of company CEOs saying actually tax is a big issue. I think we're onto it. Um, the Green Bay gave some information about uh, the plunge of audits of large companies, which also mirrored what's happening in the US. Um, then we had uh, about a year after someone sent to the newsroom a um, annotated copy of Apple's New Zealand's public accounts um, and pointing out that so this is way down buried in the notes they were paying a tax rate of 30% on their New Zealand sales, not the New Zealand rate of 28. The 30% rate is the uh, one in Australia. And it turns out that Apple uh, in Australasia had been running all their operations, well, saying they're running all their operations out of Australia and they're just paying the Australian tax office. 
So of that billion dollars a year in sales of uh, iPhones, ID was getting zero and had done for at least 10 years, as far back as I looked. I had, I, tax paper affairs still exist today. I mean, it's not Apple dodging tax because 30% 30, 30 is higher than 28, but it's the way things are structured, New Zealand gets nothing from Apple, um, which is awesome, big company. And also it's not, sort of make the argument that it's, it's sort of a gray area when it's just a service being provided but these are thousand dollar phones and they're just everywhere everyone knows them everyone's had to fork out either directly or through a plan and knowing that um it's effectively that money is vanishing offshore immediately um it's quite telling um i then also use the oa to dig out a lot of uh, uh how slowly efforts to combat this problem not exactly but towards the end of the year, and this was great timing because media awards things, you're supposed to submit stories and having impact. Right at the end of the year, um, I got leaked uh, a cabinet memo which said they were going to change the law and give more resources to IRD and try to claw back more money from these companies. And naturally, that's going to undo the time the budget roll around next year. I'm talking about an extra $300 million a year. Um, so I sort of stopped reporting. I had a chance in the preparation of this talk to have a think about um, what has happened since. And what's been quite telling is that when I so I started the series, um, then I filed an information at request to IRD to ask, okay, you've got this base erosion and profit shifting multilateral program. It's been ongoing for five or six years. And um, what's the progress on that? What what are things you are either thinking about or might be doing? Um, they initially declined to release any of that information, saying it was under consideration, which I thought frankly was ridiculous given it was five years on. And indeed, five years after I filed that request, they still haven't really done anything. So I had to fight for ages over that. Um, my interest now in, in tax it seems to be much more bespoke. I look at sort of large scale tax orders like Eric Watson, um, the uh, exploitation of um, loopholes in charity structuring because a big child care operator called Esther, which rebranded itself as a charity, and it is a uh, it's, oh, it's, 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 yeah, it's it's it's, um, it, it's 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 amazing, it's audacious. So they had this they had this company. Um, the family wanted to. Uh, I think people ran it getting old. Um, they had sort of floated on the share market in the tanks, and they brought it back. Um, and they figured out a way they could get paid out by giving it to a charity, but it would be funded by a huge loan advance from their own family trust. So then all the money, all the profits being made are being used to repay that loan, but it's all tax free. So they're actually getting paid out far faster than they would otherwise. Um, and it's pretty funny. Also, I do a lot of work uh, with the, a lot of work in trade uh, with the uh, international uh, consortium of investigative journalists who. Uh, managed the Panama Papers leaks in terms of offshore tax structure. But this beep stuff is really interesting because um, the big pushback I had initially uh, from IRD and from the government, the person from that side of the act, literally, was that the best way to manage this problem is with multilateral action. Like it's a prisoner's dilemma, we have to cooperate, we have to get the best outcome. And I was like, beeps, 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 that's the way it will give us the answers. Um, and then Trump got elected. And he had no interest in multilateral activity. It's basically been four wasted years. Um, and it's hard to see how that, how the next process has worked. It's, it's effectively um, been a 10 year kick for touch, during which time I uh, saw so all these texts, these books might be a way of putting them up, um, have continued unabated. And you know, if you've seen, if, if my numbers are, are half close to the truth, that's, that's billions of dollars. In but there has been like a piecemeal introduction of unilateral actions, mainly through um, the likes of uh, uh, digital services tax taxes, which on the likes of uh, Facebook and Google have targeted most particularly. And again, those are really crude, just targeting revenue. Um, it's crude, yes, but it's the only way to do it, which is also why I looked at revenue initially, because trying to figure out profit um, when it can get shunted and distributed in all sorts of strange ways around the world. It's extremely difficult. One thing that was really interesting early this year is uh, Janet Yellen out of the US um, talked about possibly a way through, a way to cut this Gordian knot, which would be like a global minimum 
which would make me some sort of undercut this race at the bottom, or at least put a floor on it. Um, you wouldn't get sort of the, the worst excesses of sort of Ireland and the Netherlands, um, you know, continuously lowering to, uh, to attract international um, revenue. Another thing that's um, the bottom of Australia is this IRD's tax service division. I talked about the, um, the sort of issues I had over getting just sort of high level policy discussion about tax. Um, and then one a clause in the um, in the Tax Administration Act, which allows the Commissioner to talk about individual tax cases if I get um, sort of in the interest of maintaining the tax system, or if there are genuine questions to be answered, they're able to engage. From what I understand, that clause has never been used. I think it got close during the Apple case. Um, but I, I think there does need to be more uh, openness here, and that um, there's a risk that thinking you're um, you need to reduce transparency to improve efficiency, uh, maybe counterproductive. So people stop believing that the system is working as it should, and that the outcome is fair, then uh, there's, there's a risk that people will um, start to think, you know, I'm a plumber in town, why should I not pay my tax when, you know, uh, Apple pays nothing. So, I mean, I, I don't know, it would be. It'd be these are really big issues. I don't think I can answer them, but um, it's just something that is frustrating me for some time. And there hasn't really been a good time uh, then or since. Um, in terms of the, the lessons I sort of drew from this project, um, journalism is the art of the anecdote, and that's it's often, and I never thought of this, <laughs> but um, it's often just to focus on the people and with this tax story. There were no people, um, it was just spreadsheets and uh, corporate statements. Um, but effectively, uh, the anecdote I used was sort of a cluster of companies that appeared to be most aggressive in shifting markets out of New Zealand. However, um, you cannot let anecdotes become the new, isolated anecdotes become the news, because if the anecdote is not reflective of what's actually going on, you're just um, leading people down the garden path in the wrong direction. For example, um, the, the current vaccination debate is a good example. Yes, there may be a few cases of blood clots, but is that, is that really reflective of? I mean, it's really hard to find someone who otherwise would have died if they hadn't got vaccinated. Of course, we'll never know. But, um, yeah, so, a little important note here. One is, um, don't get stuck in weeds. Uh, when I started looking at this, um, I had a lot of tax experts wanting to engage me in deep discussions about the finer points of uh, transfer pricing and tax policy. And uh, th that way, the, um, the road is lined with misery and it really interests no one. I mean, there's probably a hundred people in New Zealand really interested in policy in this area. Half of them work in IRD and half of them work in advisory firms. They have these discussions all the time. Um, much better to pull back, look at the big picture and sort of raise discussions over uh, whether policy is working or not, rather than trying to sort of micromanage it and fix it. Because I mean, I've got an honest view of public policy, but I, I'm not in a position in the space of a few weeks to rewrite the tax act. Um, however, um, the more people looking at it, the better. Uh, thirdly, the, in cases where you're researching something and there's not data there, um, a homemade data set is better than no data set. Um, my spreadsheet was messy, artisanal, um, undoubtedly, and it was really crude, but it was better than anything else out there. Um, it was quite taken with what happened in Australia. They had a similar debate, and as a result of that, the ATO, the equivalent of the IRD over there, now publishes effectively the same data I've been collating every year for large tax payers. I would have really loved it happen in New Zealand, but um, it would take me another three weeks to pull together a revised version of that. I thought occasionally pitched it, but people saying, "Oh, it's been done." It's not, it's not um, and finally, stubbornness is a virtue. Um, Staying really focused on one subject, even when you are getting stonewalled. Um, when I ended up OAA, how my OAAs were getting handled by IRD, and there were some amazing things in there. Um, one guy complaining that, oh, who's, what's this guy asking for? He's just after some stuff for a story. I was like, yes, that's what I do. Um, and then I'm sure I suppress it through the, no, this is just free and frank advice. Um, and of course, I think one of them talked about how uh, talking to me. By me was very difficult because I was wedded to my first blush analysis. Um, and that I 
wasn't going to be told by someone who was just so immersed in this that they couldn't didn't see it as news that it wasn't news. Of course, the headline numbers were really interesting. I mean, it's, so there's a lot of scholarly articles coming out talking about billions of dollars of international tax avoidance. But if you can narrow it down to what's happening in New Zealand this year amongst this set of companies, this is how much they're actually paying each year. Um, it, it's quite powerful. Oh, yeah. 